Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole, and on today's episode, we're talking about parenting kids in the preteen and teen phases of development. These can be tricky stages. They involve so much brain and body growth for our kids during these times. And as parents, we can really feel like our kids change overnight. What used to work might not work anymore. The relationship we might once had might suddenly feel different and communication with our kids might change. But even as this phase is marked by kids seeking more independence, in many ways, I feel like they need our guidance as parents more than ever during these years. But figuring out how to provide that can be tough for us. So how do we communicate best with our kids during this period of their development? And in today's world, what are the kinds of things that we should be talking with them about, especially as we're thinking about them entering the high school years? To give us insight into all of this, I've invited Michelle Eichert on the show today. Let me tell you a bit about her. She's a speaker, author, and educator who helps kids, parents, and teachers navigate the complicated social world of early adolescence. Her latest book is 14 Talks by Age 14 out right now, and it guides readers through the 14 essential conversations parents need to have with their kids before they start high school. She also has her first book, Middle School Makeover, Improving the Way You and Your Child Experience the Middle School Years. Oh my goodness, how many of us could have you know, used that when we were that age? And it's a primer for the social and emotional challenges parents and kids navigate when midlife meets middle school under the same roof. Uh, Michelle's a member of the Today Show parenting team and NBC News Learn. Her work has been featured in lots of different publications. Her leadership curriculum for middle schoolers has been implemented at schools across the U.S. And she also has a summer camp curriculum that's offered at many summer camps um, each year. She lives with her family in Charlotte, North Carolina. Michelle, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. So excited to have this conversation because this age group of kids, this sort of developmental stage, kind of gets a bad rap by, you know, parents, by educators, by people like, oh, it's such a hard age. Um, and, you know, I've often said for myself, I, I think there's very few adults who would choose to go back in time and relive these years. Like, they're just tough. Um, and as a parent of now a couple of young adults and a couple of teenagers. I feel like I've spent lots of years now personally in this as well as professionally. So I just think this is a really important um, age group to be talking about what the needs are and how we can help. I agree and I, I'm with you. I don't know many people who say, boy, I loved middle school and I'd right. love to go back and feel that same way again. Mm -hmm. Um, a few do, and and when they show up at my talks, I always say, please don't feel bad because they're they're like embarrassed. You know, right. <laughs> what's wrong that I liked it? So if that is you listening, that's great. Mm -hmm. But I will say, um, you sort of won the lottery because for most people, that was a really tough time of life, um, and that's part of why I love it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I like first of all, I like helping people through that, and I also like exploring what makes it so tough because. When you dig past all the awkwardness and the pain and you know all of that there's some really exciting stuff happening that's driving that and i find that fascinating yeah it is such a fascinating thing and i, I also I, I just am intrigued by it my very first teaching job i was a teacher way back in the day before i became a psychologist and i was a middle school special education teacher and um Man, I just found it fascinating and and loved the challenge of it. But you know, it it can feel overwhelming to a lot of people. I'm curious, just before we dive into things about the book and what we can be doing as parents, how you developed a specific interest because there's not a lot of um, us professionally who who really are curious about this and and specialize in this. So I'm curious how that happened for you. Sure. Um... To make a long story short, what happened, what had happened was I was working, I was certified to teach, mm -hmm. thought I would teach seventh through 12th grade English um, and ended up getting a job at a big consulting firm and uh, thought, oh, maybe I'm a business person. Maybe I'm not a teacher. And I went into that job and every role I had at the firm, I turned into a teaching job. So I would say, this is an interesting program. Can I please write a manual to help explain it to people? Can I lead a training on this? So I really was called to teaching and there was a huge scandal with that consulting firm. You may remember the Enron scandal way back yes. in the day. Uh -huh. Yes, so 
80,000 employees lost their jobs and I was one of them. And so at that time of my life, I had a not quite two-year-old and I was seven months pregnant mm -hmm. and no job, no maternity leave. Mm -hmm. So I really had to reinvent myself and I realized, boy, I'm always teaching anyway. Um, but again, that pregnant was like, I'm not gonna get a job right, right now. So I ended up starting a tutoring business and working with kids who were mostly in middle school. And my intention initially was, I'll help these kids get organized, teach them how to study for tests, that kind of stuff. And they began confiding in me about all the social emotional stuff they were going through that was making it so hard to focus on school. And I was sent right back to my own middle school experience, which was pretty miserable. <laughs> um, <I> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it just, I think that stuff, I call middle school the stickiest time of our lives because mm -hmm. what happens to you then sticks with you for so long because you're just, everything's forming and it gets kind of gelled into your brain. Um, so from that point on, I became fascinated with middle school development and what I could do to help kids and parents uh, get, walk through it with a bit more ease and less stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that story. That's, that's great. And I, I do think it's a, it's a period of time that can be really stressful in families because you know, there, there is this sense of, okay, my kid kind of has suddenly changed and is different. Like the things that were working before, the ways that we were connecting, the things we were talking about, like, oh my gosh, now it's just suddenly different. It can really throw parents off in terms of well, what do I do now? And I think especially in this um, age of 24 seven connection with technology and social media, like the landscape of that for kids at these um, developmental stages has gotten even more complex for sure. I agree. And it, it, it's naturally a time for reinvention for kids. Mm -hmm. as, and I call this period of life the middle school construction project because they are building the three things they need to become an adult. And when I ask parents, you know, what do you think your kid needs to build to become an adult? They'll say things like, oh, they need to become responsible and they need to be, uh, you know, critical thinkers and, and and we all know adults who are not these, these yeah. things so it's a much more fundamental construction project where they're building an adult body an adult brain and an adult identity and that identity piece is what I love to study and think about and help parents understand because that's the part where kids are reinventing they want to become an individual apart from their parents apart from their family but the up, I mean, there are many upsides to that. That's the healthy, right thing for them to be doing. The upside for parents is that it's an opportunity for parents to reinvent how they approach their kids. So if you feel like, yeah, everything, as you said, has been working up to a certain point and now it's not, know that that's natural and that this is really, it's, it's not a, a punishment, it's an opportunity. Now you get to relate to each other in a different way. And that can be very fulfilling if you can figure out how to do it, right? right. And that's what the book is supposed to help you with. Right. Well, and I, I do think it does trigger a lot of things in us as parents, depending on our own experiences during that phase of life. Um, and so I think that can lead to some of the challenge um, between some parents and kids. We get triggered by what's happening with our kids, by their responses to us, you know, we whether we're consciously aware of it or not, you know, ways that our parents related to us, um, you know, back then. And so it can, it can be a triggering time for everybody, I think. And, um, you know, many of the uh, parent listeners to this show have kids with some type of mental health challenge, um, neurodevelopmental disability. And I just want to comment on that too, that, you know, these are kids where there are some extra challenges during this time because their brain and body are going through, I love you, so this major construction project. Um, and it's an additional layer on top of some challenges they're already dealing with. So if you have a child who is prone to anxiety anyway, and now is having all these hormonal changes and all of these you know, um, social landscape changes, that can be tricky. Or even you know, a kid with autism or ADHD or those kinds of things, um, this sort of preteen, early teen stage can add just an extra layer of challenge for sure. It, it can. And, and I want to point out a study that came out in the past few years that I found really fascinating, which is that um, this study found that it was, I think it was just looking at 
at moms, that moms of kids in middle school uh, are reportedly the, that is the loneliest, yes. most stressful time of parenting yep. in any mom's life. Mm -hmm. And it's that feeling of separation and, and we've known what to do for so long and we've made choices that we think work well for the family for so long and that kind of blows up in a lot of different ways. And it can leave a parent feeling like, I thought I was good at my job. <laughs> I thought I was good at this. And now what, you know? So I, I do want to normalize that for yeah. parents that you're not alone if you feel like you're blowing it all of a sudden or like your kid doesn't want to be with you or your kid isn't maybe presenting the way you expected them to present at this age. That's all happening everywhere <laughs> to everyone in some varying degree. I think that's a really important point because parents, moms especially, tend to internalize that and think that there's something that they did. And as you pointed out, this is a normal phase. And actually, the, the upside of that is kids need to move through this phase of development in order to come out on the other side and be stable, independent, you know, well-adjusted adults. It, it's tricky, I think, because, you know, as I said in, in the intro, to the episode, it, it, it's hard because there's this push-pull at this age, right? It's like this sense of kids are pushing us away some of the time, like, I, I want my space, I want my independence, I don't want to be told what to do, and yet there's also these times when they're, like, right up next to us, like, you know, help me, be with me, fix this for me, and that can be really tricky as a parent to read that and to stay sturdy and steady within ourselves in that and to recognize that this is normal like these ups and downs these pushing away but then coming close like this is all part of that confusing but important phase and and to not resent it when your child has been dismissive of you or mean to you and then wants to cuddle up and ask you to make them a snack right. and you're like who oh, huh <laughs> now you want something from me yeah. You know, I think that can be a piece of it too, is that for many parents, they're like, heck no. Yeah. And then the kid is like, but what? I haven't done anything. <laughs> I just want to spend time with you. And then it, it creates a lot of cross wires. So just the simple perspective that you just gave of knowing this is purposeful. If my child doesn't go through this phase right now and figure out how to individuate and figure out how to be their own person. And even though it feels to me like rejection or being a contrarian or whatever it is, what it really is, is them practicing how to be independent. And if they don't do that, they're gonna end up in unhealthy relationships later in life because they haven't figured out how to be their own person. Mm -hmm. So when I can explain that to parents, I think it just eases the burden, you yeah. know, to be able to put it in that frame of view, like this isn't personal. They yeah. do not hate me. This is simply them not knowing how to do this and, and messing it up a bunch, but just figuring it out purposefully to be happier and healthier in their relationships later in life. So yeah. I'm happy to sacrifice myself when I can understand the purpose of it. It's harder to do it when I think it's just for no reason at all. Yeah. And I think that is a really important thing because we can figure out how to manage our own thoughts and feelings around that and then our own behaviors around that better when we realize that this isn't some sort of personal attack. This yes. is something that, you know, is normal and is a phase of development. So let, let's dive into then, because I think one of the, the real challenges is around how do we effectively communicate with kids at this phase where a lot of the time they seem like they want nothing to do with communicating with us. And yet we know this is an important and tricky phase of development. They do need us. They need the information and guidance and support that we offer. So let's talk about ways that we can um, effectively initiate and, and communicate. And I know that you've got some phrases that you feel like are important that help to um, increase the likelihood that we'll have some success of having connection with them. And then also some phrases that will send them going in the other direction and lead to conflict. So, so let's start with some practical things there. Sure. Um, so as you said, kids this age, they really stop wanting to talk to us quite so much. Um, and I, I do want to point out that I, I say in the book, it's the job of language to tie groups together, and it is the job of tweens and teens to break ties apart. So they become sort of incompatible at this age. 
Um, so again, I'm saying that like just to make you feel better as a listener, that this is normal. It's not just your child doesn't like you or doesn't want to talk to you, but they need to begin forming relationships with peers as part of their move towards independence. So um, I suggest that this is a time when parents need to learn a new language. They have to really relearn how to talk to their kids. Um, and as you mentioned, there are some things that turn kids off right away. <laughs> and one of the big ones is assuming how your kid feels or assuming how they will feel in the future. The yep. so one thing that I hear parents say a lot when they're trying to convince their kid not to do something or to make a certain choice, they will say, you're going to regret that later. It, and it's in this sort of all knowing omniscient, like I have experience, I've been there and I can tell you as someone who's gone through this, you will regret it if that's a choice you make. And what the kid is thinking is, you don't know me, I'm becoming my own person. You don't know what thoughts are in my head. And I know inner 13 year old Michelle would have dug her heels in and been like, I will show you what I will not regret, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just to prove that I was my right. own person who thought for myself. So um, beware making assumptions about how your child feels or will feel in the future. And, and the flip side to that, and the flip side really to most of these, what I call conversation crashers, mm -hmm is to ask your child, right? Mm -hmm. To be curious and to explore your child. So like, instead of saying you're gonna regret that, what might, what might it feel like or look like in a week if you choose that? How, how, do you, how do you anticipate other people reacting? What do you think you're gonna feel like? You know, I, whatever the example may be. Yeah. yeah. Um, so another one that kids don't like is absolutes. And this is just a sort of basic, uh, communication device that many of us fall back on, parents especially, because we can't seem to get through. And so we try to really hammer our points home. Yep. So it's like, you never pick up your stuff when I put it on the bottom of the stairs for you to carry to your room. And it's always left for me to do. And I never have the time. And these always and nevers and absolutes are really easy for a kid to discredit. Because maybe one time they did pick up one shoe and left the other one. <laughs> And took it up to their room and they're like, but I do, right? And they will remember that and they will tell you about it. <laughs> they, are, they, they are little lawyers at this age. That's so right. They're constantly arguing their case. So um, beware of using absolutes. It'll backfire. Instead, I suggest you just ask for what you need. Like instead of saying, you never do this and I always do this, just say, this is becoming hard on me. Mm -hmm. These things are here often. I feel like I'm often carrying them up. Why is it difficult for you? Let's talk about how we solve this together because you need to carry yourself upstairs. So what's a better system? Help me, help me out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that approaching it from a problem solving um, approach is, is really so helpful because not only does it get off of that hamster wheel of arguing and negotiating, but it, it focuses on building some skills, right? That they're going to need. And I think that's so important at this age as they are moving into more independence. It's like, how can we problem solve this so you can be more independent, so you learn these skills. So I, I love that. I love that approach. And I wonder what you think about too, you know, I, I've done this both as a parent with my own kids and also as a therapist with kids. Um, you, you said, you know, saying things like you're going to regret that or sort of being like in my infinite wisdom. And, and here's the thing, we, we often do know, but they don't, they can't hear that from us at that point. But I I have um, sort of shared what my experience was. You know, I, I remember when I was your age, this, this happened, this is how I felt. Um, and, and just sharing that, not in a, this is how you're feeling way, but just, you know, this was my experience with it. And in, in sort of a, a wondering way, like, I wonder if maybe that's going on for you. What, what do you find? Do you find that to be a helpful approach? I do. I think there are two, um, add-ons to that approach. I really like it. I think one is to, to ask first, yeah. can I share with you mm -hmm. my experience with this in case it helps you make your decision, yeah. right? And I only say that, like, it, it's a little precious. Like I'm at, you know, it's a, <laughs> we are sort of pandering to our audience here, yeah. but they're in an age where they appreciate that. They like, yeah. they have very little authority, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so there, when you can find a moment to give them a little authority, mm -hmm. um, then I think it feels really good to them. So yeah. just saying like, can I share this with you? Or can I tell you about what happened with me? F feels 
to them like a real shift from, oh, my mom's trying to teach me a lesson to, oh, my mom's relating to me, yeah. which mm -hmm. I think is really nice. Um, and then I do have a piece in the book where I talk about, you know, beware the overshare. So yeah. um, I, I think many parents have a really good uh, sort of internal, internal barometer for what's appropriate to share and what's not, and some don't. And maybe they weren't modeled, you know, what was appropriate to talk about with their parents. So. Um, there's some guidance in there for what is okay to share and what's not. You know, you hear parents sharing things that they're sharing just to disparage the other partner yeah, or right. person in their life, or they're sharing to get cool points, you know, like, listen, I'm someone you can trust because I also drank a ton when I wasn't, you know, right. right. <laughs> so right. there are certain <laughs> things that you do not want to share. Yeah. Um, and, and if you're kind of wondering what should I, or shouldn't I share that's in there too, with some yeah. tips. I think that's a great point. And that, that does shift over the course of those years. I mean, what might really be inappropriate to share from your own personal experience with a 12 or a 13 year old is really different than an 18, you know, or a 20 year old, depending um, on that and, and realizing that, you know, there's such profound um, developmental shifts during this time. I mean, you know, it, it's always so interesting to me when you think about we put ninth through 12th graders together in the same building and yet the difference cognitively, socially, emotionally, physically between That's right. ninth graders and 12th graders. It's like night and day. They are totally different human beings. 14 and 18. 14 yeah. is like still cuddly and cute. 18 right. is like a man. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think just recognizing that and, and to your point, it's important to gauge, you know, where your kid is in that. And, and for those of you who have children who may be chronologically are in these years, but still developmentally in various ways, maybe younger, you need to use that as a gauge too, in terms of, you know, what you focus on, how much you share and, and how you approach some of these um, tricky topics, which, which we'll get into in a minute. Continuing this idea of strategies that are helpful around communication, let's talk about what you find to be the best setup for that. So the, the best kind of places, time, situations, because man, can we go wrong quickly when we do not navigate that properly, right? So what, right. how do we set that up well? So I think a couple things to keep in mind when you're setting this up. One is that kids this age are, are impulsive thinkers, yeah. right? Um, and that often improves over time, a long period of time, but, uh, they don't like to feel ambushed because if you bring up a subject and they haven't had a chance to sort of process it on their own, they're going to feel like it's a battle. Like you've already prepared, you know, what you want to say, they're have to, having to come off the cuff or they don't like to multitask. They're focusing on something else, whether it appears to you to be valuable or important doesn't okay. matter. Um, so I say, just be really careful about the ambush. And a nice thing you can do is to schedule a time to talk with your tweener teen. So if you know, you've noticed grade slipping and you're concerned about that rather than while they're having a snack at the counter, you say, Hey, let's talk about grades. What's going on. I noticed they're not what I expected. You can just say something like, Hey, I was looking at the, uh, you know, the online portal, it looks like grades uh, might be a little different than we expected. When can we set up a time to talk about this? Do you want to talk about it after dinner? Do you want to do it tomorrow after school? You let me know. Yeah. So that's a really good way to get started. Um, you can let your kid pick the place. Where would you like to talk about this is a good one too. And so many parents will say that not having eye contact during these conversations yeah. is helpful. Um, I have a, a sort of Gen generic tip that I recommend to every parent of a child age 11 and up. Um, and it's my best communication tip and it has nothing to do with what you say. Uh, it's a tip I call having a Botox brow. Mm -hmm. So there is um, a really cool study that came out of one of Harvard's teaching hospitals where they took adults and put them through an MRI and showed them pictures of people's faces and said, can you tell me what this person feels by looking at their face? And adults can do that really well. They can say that person's angry or that person's scared or they're happy. And the MRI shows that they use a different part of their brain. The, they use the prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. and teens doing the same experiment got it wrong half the time. They use the emotional center of their brain. All this to say, 
your child, when they look at you and they see your forehead scrunched up, which to me is like, I'm focused on you. I love you. I'm listening. That's my focused face. <laughs> to them, it reads angry. So there's so often miscommunication between parents and kids this age because kids just, they can't read facial expressions until they get older very, very well. Um, so say how you feel, that's helpful. Like, I'm not angry, I'm curious. You can use your words, like we say to our toddlers. Um, or you can just have what I call a, pretend you're overly Botoxed on a late night talk show and you cannot move your forehead. So just have a completely neutral forehead, not wide-eyed and crazy, but just totally neutral. And this is the tip that parents come back to me over and over again and say, that was a game changer. My kid talks to me more now because they don't think I'm mad at them. Yeah, it's a yeah. great, it's a great, Point. And, you know, even as I, I'm thinking about um, kids who have various kinds of processing challenges anyway, right. the whole reading of nonverbal communication adds a, an additional layer of challenge and complexity. And so just neutralizing that, taking that more out of the equation helps them to be more attuned to what's actually going on and what you're actually talking about. And along those lines, I find texting to be super helpful mm -hmm. in this situation. So mm -hmm. sometimes, again, if a kid wants to think at their own pace and not your pace of conversation, you can just say, you know, send a little text like, hey, I was hoping we could talk about this. We can do it over text or you can come in my room tonight if you want. Mm -hmm. Totally up to you. Um, but lots of kids are not great auditory processors or they want to just go at their own rate of speed. And I think texting or a chat feature through technology can be very useful here. Love that. And I have found that being in the car yeah. is such a place where kids at these um, ages will open up because there is no eye contact. There's sort of like something else is going on, but you're there in the same place. You have privacy. And it's interesting because as I've talked with parents over the course of the last year with the pandemic, you know, many of them have said that that's been one of the things that they've realized without having all of the things that they typically take their kids to or in the car that they've realized that that has really reduced the number of conversations and communication opportunities because it, it made them aware of how much of that happens when they're traveling in a car together. It's so true. So maybe walking the dog. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a similar right. replacement. Yep. Yeah. But I think, I think that point about you know, we tend to think like, we're going to have this conversation, sit down, like sit across. And it's like, no, no, be doing something else. Yes. You know, whether yes. it's making a snack together in the kitchen or walking the, be doing something else because kids, especially at that age, they don't want to have that pressured feeling of, you know, we're here and you're talking to me about something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about ways to help kids stay engaged or interested and open? I mean, does that have to do with like the kinds of questions that we ask or how do we really keep them with us? Because I know a lot of parents feel like they put something out there and then immediately the kid's like, I don't want to talk about that. Or, you know, they, they listen for a minute and then it's like, yep, I'm done with this now. So how do we sort of keep that going? So that is the, the uh, crux of the reason that I created what I call the brief model for conversations. And that is this universal approach that I explained in the beginning of the book. And then I, uh, for every topic in there, I, I offer up a script of like, here's how this model can be used to talk about a bazillion different things. But you're right, parents think, oh gosh, I have max 30 seconds <laughs> to, to get my kids' attention before they zone out or pick up their phone or walk away or roll their eyes. And so what they tend to do is start at the end of a conversation with like, hey, listen up real quick. I need to tell you, I don't ever want to catch you vaping. It's right. terrible, you know, right? So they're like quick yep. to the punch. And that turns, that would turn anyone off. Of course, it turns a tween or a teen off, but though I understand the impulse to try to get through while you can. The BRIEF model, BRIEF is an acronym, and each letter stands for a different step in the process. So if a parent can begin to adopt this process for their conversations with their kids, they will find that the kids are much more willing to stick around for longer. So the B is begin peacefully, and that's just starting with like, you're not hitting the nail on the head. It's a gentle curiosity about the topic, not about the kid, yeah. not have you ever vaped? But right. like, what have you heard about, like, what are kids thinking about vaping these days? Do they think parents are like totally overblowing this issue? So little begin peacefully. 
And then R is relate to your kid. So that's just showing them that you are not there to bust them. You're not suspicious. This is not an interrogation. It's just like, you know, I, I can, these are, I know these conversations can be kind of weird. I remember having them with my parents, but they were about smoking cigarettes. This is like a new territory and I'm happy that I can learn from you. Mm -hmm. um, I is interview for data. And this is where you can start to ask some questions. But again, I say it sort of clinically interview for data because I don't want it to feel like it's an emotional interrogation. You're again, you're not trying to bust your kid. You're just trying to develop a rapport where you can talk about hard things together, right? So this might be just some general questions like, well, what are you seeing? And what have you, have you read any articles about what the health repercussions are, you know? things like that. Um, e is echo what you hear. And anybody who's been to a therapist or seen yep. a therapist on TV knows how this goes. This is like, okay, so it sounds like you're saying, yep. you know, some kids do it, but it's maybe less than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then F is feedback. And this is the final part of the process. This is where the parent can give some advice, make a suggestion, if needed, offer limits or boundaries, whatever the case may be. But when you start there, that's when kids tune you out immediately. Yeah. When you work your way up to that a little bit more gradually, there's this building of trust and rapport mm -hmm. that keeps kids hanging around. Yeah, I think that's great and such a helpful process to think about, as you said, really with any topic. And in the book, you really focus on these 14 topics or these 14 mm -hmm. conversations um, that we need to be broaching with kids at this developmental stage and, and using that brief model, you know, of, of to, to have those conversations. Let's, you know, we, we won't have time to get into all of them, but how did you arrive at these 14? Are these things that you find are just really important to start the conversation around because they're things that kids will be exposed to as they get into high school? How, how did you arrive at these 14 and then maybe just share a couple of them? So I wanted to really think about the whole child. I, I didn't want every conversation to be a bummer. Like, <laughs> like uh, what is a bad thing that could happen to a kid in high school? Right. Okay, we're going to talk about drinking. We're going to talk about, you know, uh, being taken advantage of sexually. We're going to, like, I, it's not like that. Right. What I did is I, <clears throat> I listed all those out. I listed out everything and, and I went, <laughs> I actually rented an Airbnb for a week and it looked like a serial killer's apartment because I wrote on little index cards, every possible like horrible thing yeah. or interesting thing or important thing that you might want to talk to your kid about at this age. And then I just laid them all over the Airbnb. And then I looked for patterns and I was like, okay, there are 10 things here you'd want to talk to your kid about. And they range from please wear deodorant to suicide. Yeah. And they are all under the umbrella of taking care of yourself, mm -hmm. right? So the chapters themselves are these kind of broader whole child concepts like creativity, independence, taking care of yourself. And within them are sample conversations that just run a broad range of things that could come up in middle school and high school. And that I want parents to practice talking about again, because it's about rapport building so that later, if something happens, you know, you never want your child to feel like I couldn't go to my mom. It would have been weird, right? I, I, that's what I'm trying to erase. Yeah, I think that that's great because there's so many of those things and it can feel overwhelming as a parent too, to even know like, where do I start with all of this? And, you know, things are different now. The, you know, the stuff that our parents were needing to talk with us about or that we wish they would have talked with us about. Many of those things are the same, but, but there are additional things now too. Um, and, and I think one of the challenges for parents of kids who maybe in some areas of their development are, um, you know, a bit younger or, or less mature, there's this dynamic of trying to figure out, okay, they're going to be in a high school building um, so there are things that we need to talk with them about, and yet they're thinking about things in a younger, maybe more naive way. That can be a real challenge for some parents, you know, whether their child maybe has um, a more significant learning disability or a developmental disability, or, you know, even things like um, more significant ADHD, that they're, they're just less mature there. It's like, okay, I have to talk with them about, like, they might walk into the bathroom of the school and some kid may be vaping or there might be kids, you know, smoking pot in there or whatever might be going on. I need to help them 
understand those things and yet still, you know, recognize that they're developmentally maybe at a younger phase. I think that's really challenging for a lot of parents. It is. And I think one thing that's helpful is, is asking questions before you begin to explain. Yes. So like, tell me what you noticed. Mm -hmm. What do you think's going on? What, what did it, how did it make you feel? And what are your concerns and what would you like to know? Yeah. Because sometimes the kid can say, you know, I'd like to know what it felt like, what they were doing. Or they might say, I'd like to know if it's weird if I just turn around and walk out, yep. you know? Yep. So before you assume what you need to say to them, do a little detective work. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think that's so true. And for some kids, it is a matter of giving them some specific scripts or strategies or whatever. Like, look, if you encounter this, this is how you're going to handle it. I was talking with a family, it's like perfect timing of this because I was talking to a family yesterday, parents of a 15 year old who developmentally is more like probably a fifth grader, but is now in eighth grade and heading into high school next year. We were talking about this issue and I said, look, he's not thinking about all of these things in that way, but he's a target, right? He's going to be vulnerable. And so we need to give him some scripts, some strategies where if you walk into the bathroom and X, Y, or Z is going on, let's talk about how that might feel. And also here's what you're going to do. You're going to back right out of that bathroom and you're going to go right back to your teacher because, you know, kids, especially if they are just more, um, innocent or naive or developmentally not quite there yet, they, they need us to provide them with some real specific tools for that, I think. And I would say, almost uh, even as an adult, I would love to to be able to have a script or a tool. There are many times someone says something at a party and I'm like, ooh, I, it'll take me three days to figure out what to say back to that, you know? And so um, for sure for the kids who you're describing and for sure for all kids, I think it's very helpful to think ahead, role play, talk about stuff, what might happen and what you can do because most of us get sort of cut off at the knees at some point, yeah. especially in high school. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I love how you divided up, you know, you talked about these sort of categories of things, because I do think that a lot of times at this age, parents are like, oh, I need to sit down and have the conversation with my kid about sex or about smoking or about drugs or whatever. And first of all, to recognize that these are ongoing conversations. These are not things that we should just be thinking about. All right, I got to work myself up to like sitting down and talking about this one time and then I can say I've done it. Yeah, that, that's not really how that works. So these are evolving things, but also that while we think about these big sort of maybe things that could be personal safety issues or or whatever, there's lots of things we should be talking about. Like, I love that you cover these conversations around creativity and changing in friendships and taking care of yourselves. These are things that our kids at these stages are wrestling with and can use some guidance and support around. So I, I just think that's important for us to hone in on, that it's not just these important conversations around you know, teen pregnancy and, um, you know, drug use and, and what college you're going to go to. It's about connecting with them as on this level of a whole person and everything that they're dealing with. I love that. That's exactly the intention of the book. And just to keep the door open because I, I could never write a book that included every conversation I hope you'll have with your kid. My hope is that this is a way for you to practice and not worry about being perfect. You don't need to know the right answer. You're just working on developing that language skill with your kid and that relationship so that when the conversation comes up that is specific to your child, whatever it may be, they feel really comfortable coming to you. Yeah, which is really what we want at that age. Even yeah. if we feel like they're pushing us away, they want nothing to do with us, we keep leaving that door open and showing up as a person who can provide that support when it's needed and invariably they will take advantage of that and come to us if they yeah. feel like they can. And I work with so many teens and young adults in therapy who feel like that door is not open with their parent. And that can lead to a lot of um, emotional distress, a lot of behavioral issues. They just need to feel, even if we feel like we're being really clumsy at it, just continuing to put ourselves out there in that way, even if it seems like they don't want it, there will come a day where they will 
lean into that and, and then we can be there for them in that way. And I think just trusting that process is so critical. Gosh, that is perfect. There will come a day. Yeah. You just keep at it. I love that. Yeah. So this book is fantastic. It's 14 talks by age 14. It is out now. Go get it. Whether you have a kid in this age range right now, whether you have one who's younger, because guess what? They're going to be in this phase, you know, sooner than you imagine. And even if you have an older kiddo who is still at home, who, who you're still working with around these things, these tools for how to have these kinds of productive conversations and keeping these communication doors open, I think are helpful to us in so many areas of our life. So really want to recommend that people get the book. Michelle, share with us, where can everyone go to get more information about you and your work? And, and specifically, where can they get the book? Sure. Okay. The book is available pretty much at all booksellers. So that's, you know, Amazon to Target to your favorite little indie bookstore. Um, my website is just my name. So it's Michelle with two L's. And then my last name is spelled I-C-A-R-D. So it looks like iCard, michelleicard.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. I'm having a ton of fun on Instagram right now. So please join me there. Yes. <laughs> um, keeping my it favorite, fun and funny. My favorite current platform. <laughs> yes, I, you know, I shied away from it for a, for a long time. I, I was real Facebooky, and I'm still on Facebook, but I've, I've just fallen in love with it recently. So it's just my name, Michelle Eichard. And then if anyone's interested, I have a private parenting group on Facebook. It's called Less Stressed Middle School Parents. Oh, love so it. Find me there where you can talk about all your concerns and worries, and we will put you at ease. Every parent of a middle schooler needs that group. Man, I wish I had known about that a few years ago. Um, great resources. We'll make sure that all of those links are in the show notes so that all of you can um, take advantage of finding that, um, the information and the resources uh, quickly and easily. Go get the book. Michelle, such a great conversation. Um, really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and just sharing um, about this really important um, age range with us today. Thank you. I love talking with you. All right, everybody. Thanks as always for being here. We'll catch you back here next week for our next episode of the Better Behavior Show.